Well, welcome. I'm Dr. Thaddeus Gell with my good friend and colleague, Susan Pressler. And tonight we're, talking, we're going to be talking about sex and women, fanning the female flame. This is going to be good. Yeah. I'm looking forward to this. So a couple things here before we jump in. So Susan is an expert in women's health and women's sexuality. And we've been getting a lot of questions, uh, not only here at the clinic, but just in general about women's health and sexuality. So we figured let's do a video on sex and women Fanning the female flame. So I got I got the red tie because I figured tonight, who knows, this might get a little, might get a little bit spicy. Uh -huh. So we'll see. I'm gonna go ahead and post in the comments here, if uh, just while you're listening. That way, if you want, you can certainly see about learning more about Susan and her work or getting a copy of her book. So I'll just put it up here just to 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 start with. It's a great copy of her book called Fanning the Female Flame, and I love the title: How to Increase Your Sexual Desire Without Changing Partners. So I guess my first question is, what made you come up? With that, with that title? You know, I was really impressed by the women I see who love their mate, really love their partner, didn't want to trade him in or her in, but they wanted more spice in their bedroom. And I was curious, there wasn't a lot out there about how they could do that. And these men were great and the women were great, and, but they still weren't connecting. It wasn't that they weren't great and it wasn't that they didn't want great sex, it's that they didn't know how to connect about it. And there are certain obstacles that women have that they have to get around. So I work with women. Some, I have done some work with men's classes, but mostly my audience is women. So I am helping them get around those obstacles. But they had the basic ingredients. They had the great woman, the great man. They were both interested, but they weren't connecting. It wasn't happening. I'd love to hear a quick background of, of how did you even get into this field? And how did you even go down this, this vein of, of health? Yeah. Or, or making, it, making it your specialty. Well, I was in primary care for a couple decades, and I noticed, and it was when I was working at the university here in Ashland, um, and I noticed that when, at first it was a young woman who came in who was transferring to an East Coast school. She wanted an annual exam, and she came in, and we considered ourselves an educational institution, even in the health center. We were going to take every opportunity to educate. So when she said she'd had um, 32 partners that year, you go, okay, what message do I want to give this woman? You know, and I only had half an hour, and it wasn't all about STDs. It was about how precious do you feel you are, you know, or what are you looking for? I wanted to try to figure out really what was going on, but you don't have much time. So I did the best I could with her. Sure. But what I thought about that night, she didn't go out of my mind. And I realized that how a woman relates to her sexuality or sexuality in general, my attention went there. Whether I was being paid for it or not, I was curious about how a woman related to her sexuality and how she made choices about it and how she made it great for, and then later on I got interested in the mated people. But it was just, uh, you know, just a plain curiosity. And I realized, boy, I'd been in medicine long enough, I could study what was interesting. Right. So that's how I got into it. And you know, first I started um, studying experts across the country, LA and Boston, and figured out who knew what was going on. I heard David Schnarch speak, I was on a panel, he was the speaker after us, and he spoke about seeing the bedroom as the doorway to a person, their psychology, and he dealt with sexuality. And when he stood up there and spoke, I realized that's what I want to do, but I want to do it not from a psychological point of view, from a medical point of view. But that's, that was the place that was, inter that intersection was what was interesting to me. And then I, then I started studying with people. Seems to me, stereotypically speaking, that our society typically revolves around the, the, the masculine energy or the male sexual drive, even with pornographic materials or just, just in general. There isn't a big push for saying it's okay and it's safe to be a female and to express that or to dive into that. Yeah. Um, where, do you, where do you think some of that, that stigma comes from, even just getting that topic out in front, like you said, like that, like that patient that you had that had 32 partners in a year, and you're thinking, and, and not to pass judgment whether that was good or bad, but yeah. just thinking, okay, so what was going on in this, this person's mind to have that be the actions that she took? Right. So what do you think is maybe kind of this, some of the stigmas or myths or misconceptions around women, sexuality, pleasure, gratitude? 
in your all that? Boy, you asked me. That's a big question. <laughs> that's a very big question. I think that that's complex, but it's not really complex, but there's so many pieces to why a woman is inhibited about claiming her sexuality and why men are not inhibited, you know, why men are studs and women are sluts and, you know, that whole piece. And part of it, I think, is based in really biological truth. Women can die from having sex. You know, they can have a pregnancy that kills them. So there are real risks to being sexual. And I think society tried to protect the women, you know, make sure she had a partner who was going to be around to support the baby. So I think some of the whole, um, you know, clamping down on women's sexuality is done from a, a place that's not a misogynistic or something, even though there's misogyny added on a lot, I think there's a real thing that women are at risk when they be, choose to be sexual, that men aren't, you know, so I, that, that's just one comment. Sure. And then um, families and cultures try to keep order and they try to keep, you know, health and safety, but then a lot more is added on that doesn't need to be there. And so you have a lot of judgment about um, people who have different sexual practices or people who really flaunt their sexuality or people who um, flirt with people, you know, that they don't know, you know, she's a loose woman or, you know, it's, you're pointing to such a real thing. When we look at our language, we don't have language for women who embrace their sexuality. It's all negative, whereas a guy can be a stud or a... Um, a, a jock, or you know, there's positive connotations. The, the, the locker room bravado. Yeah, sure. yeah, is seen as a it builds you up as a male, where the same thing is ambivalent. But when you talk to when you talk to people, or you talk to a man, he wants a, a really present, sexually present woman, but he doesn't want her to act that way in other places. Right, <laughs> right. you know. And there's truth in that. You want to you wanna show who you really are to your partner, but you don't want to show it to the man on the street. And how you learn not to do that is an art that needs to be passed down because you don't inappropriately want to do a sexual cue to someone that you don't intend to follow up with, you know, right. who's not safe, who's not particularly desirable. So there's a lot to teach a young woman about how to embrace her sexuality, um, and then, of course, then there's adolescence where people are trying to experiment to learn what their sexuality is, and they may go overboard or, or get stifled. But there's a role to teach a woman how to embrace her sexuality and use it appropriately because it's a power. Women's sexuality is a power, and it's also a, a valued commodity. You know, that's, it's why my sons took showers in middle school, was to get closer to the female person. <laughs> it's why they have careers, you know, to get closer to that female person. I mean, they want to be close to that female person. Like I said in my book, I used my younger son as an example. We were talking about movie stars, who, what movie stars we like. And he, at first he said Meg Ryan, and then he said Penelope Cruz. Oh. And he said, I just love her voice. I just want to get close to it. I don't care if she's yelling at me. I just want to be close to it. So women have this power, and they need to use their power respectfully and artfully. You know, and men have power too, and they need to do the same thing, use their power respectfully. So we, we, each of the genders have these powers, and they can, be, they can powerfully get together as well. But you want some context and education around it. You know, I, th I think there's a stereotype that, that women kind of hold all the cards. That, you know, kind of like the saying that a woman, a, a, ma a man could go out to a bar and may or may not go home with a mate. Yeah. Versus most women could go out and if they choose, they could most likely go home with someone. And so from the standpoint, again, of, of that, I think there is a lot of power in, in, being, in, in being the woman. How does that unspoken or spoken responsibility. I'm not, I'm not saying that there's a should or could, but, but some of the stereotype power, I guess, how do women, how do women navigate that power knowing that, that they kind of hold the cards? How does that play into the psyche of, of how they put themselves out there and how do they express themselves and what's okay, what's not okay in sending the right, the wrong messages? Like you said, make, sending a signal and realizing, well, if I send that signal, there's maybe a follow-up. Mm -hmm. And having that dialogue, creating that space. 
Well, I think first you want to realize it's a power that you have and you can use it or not. Because um, a, lo a lot of the women I see aren't using that power. You know, they used it to get their partner or their husband, but they're not, then they forget about it and they're not using it and it's boring. Well, and you're not saying power manipulative. I, no. And, and I no, know, I'm a, just going to be yeah. clear. Yeah, there's no, when you're in a relationship, it's fun to play with that power. It's what keeps it interesting. Right. So you don't want to forget that you have that power. And I, and I see a lot of women who get caught in ordinary life and they forget they have that power and they don't use it. And, they're, and, then they're, um, and they tone down their sexuality rather than uh, to turn it up. And now they have a safe person available. He's been there when they've given birth maybe. He's been there when they've had 104. They could show and reveal even more, but nobody's giving them permission to do that or saying it's a great thing or it has its own reward. So they're, and society is saying, be a good girl. So they're, they're toning it down. And I see that a lot. Whereas I'm telling them, you, you feel safe with your partner. He's been there. He, he respects you. He gives you positive messages. Have some fun, you know, express yourself, buy some lingerie. You know, you, they get caught in their other identities, their mother identity, their worker identity, their volunteer identity. They forget they have a lover identity. And, and nobody's reminding them. So I feel sometimes that that's what I'm doing. I'm reminding them they have a lover identity. You know, the whole bedroom isn't for sorting laundry, you know. <laughs> right. It's for something else. And you, there's a whole room there that you can claim. And So around that, what would you say would be maybe your top one, two, or three tips to reclaim the, 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 the power, the bedroom, the energy? Yeah. Well, remi space. reminding them who they really are. You know, they're an aesthetic, sensual being. And even though the world is telling them they're a worker or volunteer or a mother, they're also this other thing. So just reminding them. Um, and then I have my, I have some props here. So what do we have here? And yeah, what's the relevancy here? So women have a lot of obstacles to claiming their sex life and they need allies. Truly, truly, they need allies. Over the last years working with women, I realized life gets in the way. So their first ally or one that I like to use is they need a bulldozer. And they need a bulldozer because they need a lot of power to move other things out of their life so sex can, have, can be a priority. So sometimes that means changing their lifestyle so they're not tired at 9 o'clock at night. Sometimes it means getting babysitters. Sometimes it means um, spending the energy to redecorate their bedroom. Sometimes it means flirting. But, what it, but they need a bulldozer, honestly. They need to be told it's important. And they need to, um, inside themselves, realize what it will give back to them if they do claim their bedroom. And so they need a bulldozer, honestly. It's just not a lightweight activity to, cl to clear a woman's schedule. Most women I know are way too busy. They, they need this. So. Well, and on that, you know, I, I've heard the saying that for women, foreplay is an all-day event. And for men, it's getting naked. <laughs> so I guess maybe, I don't know if you found that there's any truth to that. Oh, absolutely. So how would that bulldozer, how would you create that space th throughout, throughout the day? Well, I, you know, you said something earlier that I'll respond to when you mentioned, you know, it's male-oriented and there's pornography. But there's something else that's kind of hidden that women do for arousal. That's different than, you know, most, most people will look at pornography. I feel, I, feel like I'm I'm about to learn, about to, I feel like I'm about to hear some secret, some secret right. women insight here. This is good. Most people who look at pornography, not all, are male. But the thing that women do is they buy romance novels. Romance novels are a big market. And romance novels are arousing to women. So women read romance novels or novels with um, superhero characteristics who are, you know, are, you know, that are, um, that only one woman can fill this person's dream, those kind of novels. Right. And they will, and there's context and story, and they will have arousal from that. So it, it's hidden, mm -hmm. and I wasn't even too aware of it until I was in this field, that there are, 
I don't know the number, but hundreds of thousands of romance novels are sold and read quietly <laughs> around the country. And it's an arousal, you know, it acts sure. as an arousal thing. And then does that maybe revolve more around a relationship and the connectivity? As And again, I'm just being very stereotypical, yeah, we, versus a male is more mating, kind of doing his thing and, and going yeah. off to the next thing. Testosterone, you, you guys are high in testosterone, and testosterone is all about genital engagement. It's not about... The connect connecting or, or closeness or things. So you're, you're primed to put genital engagement before cuddling, except when you're 70, your hormones change a little bit and there's different <laughs> neurotransmitters. But, but a woman is mostly, she's estrogen and progesterone with a little bit of testosterone that peaks at ovulation time and is more dominant right before her period. So she's completely hormonally wired differently in terms of desire or horniness. So for women, arousal is an all-day event, yeah. or foreplay is an all-day event. What, is, what does she need to do? And then maybe also, yeah, what does she need to do for herself? And then maybe what, what also can she do to help foster the, the, the proper engagement or instructions to her partner? Yeah. Um, so if it is a male partner, that there's that, there's that, like you said, if males are more primary genital, you know, genital engaged yeah. and oriented, Versus saying, hey, this is important to me. I like it when you do this and this. And that creates this bond or this connection or intimacy that then later in the day or later in the evening, it's going to make it more likely that something's going to happen. Yeah. There, there are very specific things that you want to tell the male to do. to have because, be because women, we can't read your mind. <laughs> yeah. The, the woman gets fed by your attention. So, and it also relaxes her and she's likely to open more. And this I really, I put in the book and I really picked this up from um, Paul Richards who lives in Ashland, really introduced me to this fact and it is true and I see it over and over again. Women thrive in male attention and then sometimes they do weird things to get it, but they thrive in male attention. Men really want to have access to an active female Engage, you know, a femaleness. They want to be part of femaleness. So if you as a male pay really good attention, personal attention to your woman over the day, you see what she's doing, you offer your assistance, you um, listen, she is going to be more open to you. Um, and that's why you say it, it's for plays an all day thing. She's basking in your attention. She, um, she actually has access to your power, you know, you guys go and you take the garbage out or you build the wall or you do this. She wants something in the garden. You're out there digging it. You are paying attention to what she wants and delivering it. And you are offering her your attention. And she, in exchange, and in a way, it's like an exchange. She's, she's sharing with you her femininity. And it starts, and that's not in the bedroom. That's all day long right. in the moment. So you really want to, I actually, you know, you actually think of a person as having a field and phys, and you are actually offering your attention and putting it on her, you know, and it feeds her like, like food in a fishbowl, you right. know? Yeah. And she is actually opening herself up and offering her femininity to you and you can feel it, you know, it's there. It's like the flame. And the more you feed it, the more the flame is, is open. It sounds to me like the, like kind of the pro or expert tip would be maybe looking at the, the different love languages and trying to really do that in terms of whatever that person's love language is and giving attention to that throughout the day. So maybe someone, it's act of service, other one, it's words of affirmation or appreciation. I, underneath it all, you're just including her in your field of attention and really offering it. I, almost on a biochemical or energetic level, you're offering her your attention. So whatever it is, and it may change, women change, it may not always be the same thing, you're offering your attention. So when you walk in a room, you can see, just if you offer your attention, watch if she doesn't perk up. You know, she'll perk up. I, I could go on, and, and it would be a little bit of a rabbit hole to tell you stories of what I've well, seen women do I, to no, get... I'd love to hear one. Let's hear it. Okay. So I worked with a couple that were not getting along, and they weren't getting along about sex. And they were in their 30s, early 30s. And she um, was saying no, and he was frustrated. I, I'll never forget what he said. He goes, I wish having sex was like having lunch. You just, every day at noon, it was just there. <laughs> <laughs> I won't ever forget that. <laughs> so I was like, sorry, it doesn't work that way. So she, um, 
she realized they were, he, he was an expert in a field that she was more of a novice in, and so she would perform for him and he would give her attention. And she realized, after we had this conversation and I really identified that dynamic, she goes, oh my goodness, I love it when I perform for him. I get his undiluted attention. And I really, really like that. And what do you mean by perform? You mean like... He, she did um, singing. Oh, so, okay. And he would coach her because he was okay. a musician. So um, and she said, and then we went on, and, and maybe it was in the next session, he was saying how she seems to get very upset all the time. You know, she'll be doing dishes, and all of a sudden she, she's, it's too much for her, and she has to go sit down. And he, as the rescuer, would come up and finish the dishes for her. But she realized afterwards that the whole reason she was having the spell and having to sit down is she wanted his attention. It was nothing about anything else. And when she realized that, she could then say, hey, would you come sit beside me? Or would you come give me a hug? Would you put your arm around me? And so that whole dance of, oh my God, I'm weak and I've got to sit down, was really an indirect way to get his attention. Sure. She wanted his attention. And she wasn't, oh, and he used to go in and watch TV, and she'd come out and be critical. What were you doing? You know, she was annoyed right. she wasn't getting his attention. Rather than saying, hey, stop watching TV, you're always on TV, what, what maybe it would have been is the, is the solution of, hey, will you come spend time with me? Or yes. rather than, because I, I think I've heard some people say, gosh, you're always watching TV, or gosh, it's so frustrating, you're always watching TV, you're always doing this, as opposed to saying, hey, I really would appreciate it if we could. Right, it's a criticism. And, and giving the, yeah, it's a criticism as opposed to really saying what they, I want you. What, what, what's wanted. You know, the, the thing is, I want you. You know, they, they, if they say to the guy, I want you and I want you to be close to me, it's a whole different message than why are you watching TV so much? So what was the solution in, in that case? You know, she, did, did it turn into like lunch? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know recently, but I think... Um, the last time I knew, they haven't called me back, so maybe that's a good sign. <laughs> yeah, she, they got a lot more relaxed about um, uh, sexuality and what it meant, and they were, um, he was freer with his attention, and she stopped doing the criticism and the funny little dance about she was overwhelmed, and yeah, and they, um, and I don't know, but I assume it was good because I didn't, I don't know more. Well, it, it sounds like a good lesson, and to me, it's, it's a reminder of I'm thinking, myself, it's a good reminder to really try to have, have self-awareness as best as you can. And I think self-awareness is probably one of the toughest skills out there because I think we're, I think it's almost from when you're young, it's almost as so-and-so made me so angry or so-and-so made me so mad. So we're, we kind of grow up with this mindset that it's the world is happening to us as opposed to us being in charge of our world and, and really being, having it be okay with saying what we really want and being mm -hmm. self-aware with that level of communication yeah to me i'm just reminded of of being very very clear and trying to make i statements of you know i really like it when as opposed to you do this or you make me angry it's boy i really appreciate it when we can yeah those i statements are really great and disclosures you know if you start talking about you this and you that you're dancing in their camp and they're not going to be very comfortable right but if you disclose it lands gently in the room and yeah, it doesn't ruffle any feathers usually. I mean, I think it's probably the root of many problems in the world, but where do you see the communication breakdown? Where is that usually on the, the spectrum of, of, of where the real problem is? Yeah, a lot of couples can't talk. They, they get in the bedroom and they think things are supposed to happen automatically, that we're supposed to know everything. These parts go together and it should yeah, just happen. exactly, like magic. Rather, whereas orgasm for women is an educate you... The longer you're together, the more likely you are to orgasm, and the education can be involved. You're saying duration in a partnership or yes. in, in, or in, in being during sexual. intimacy? Yeah. No, in length of time in a partnership or length of time that you've been sexual. Okay. You, your capacity to know yourself and be self-aware increases, and so does your orgasm rate. So the longer that someone is with a partner, you're saying if done properly, and that, that connection and connectivity and everything that comes with that, the easier it'll be for women to orgasm and, and essentially that it, that it gets better with time. It gets one of the few things that gets better with time, <laughs> yes. And there's a lot of communication because even women who are very wise and very articulate, they fail to, to have the language 
because their expectation is so high that they should already know or think something's wrong with them. So they fail to say, you know, that worked or that touch is great. They, they're not in the moment. They want to lay back and just have magic happen. But they right. need to be with the other person communicating about little things. When you build on those little things, you have a better outcome. But if you're quiet, uh, it's interesting to watch. A lot of women, something doesn't feel good, but they won't communicate about it, and they hope the next time it's different. But I really coach them to um, move the hand or say what is good or go back to the previous thing that was happening so that they're right with their partner moment by moment to um, move things in a direction because there are two arousal speeds in that bedroom and and in my practice mostly men are high if you want both people to be at a 10 men are often at a seven or eight by the time they enter and women are at a two or three and often we're getting the woman up right. you know it's often it's not always 10 15 percent of the time it's not that but you're mostly working to w bring the women up to their arousal level high and the guy's already there I work with women and try to get them to know what they're interested in, but most time, many times they don't know. Um, they haven't been given permission to experiment about what kind of touch or activities or um, positions work. And so they think something's wrong with them and they get more quiet instead of more curious. And I try to get them to, more, to experiment more and be more curious because every female, almost every female that I examine has incredible capacity to have a great sexual experience physically. It's just how to use the equipment. So it's, 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 the system is set up for women to fail. Yeah. And in that you can turn on the TV, a, a, a child can much easier turn on the TV and see someone getting shot in the History Channel or, or see a war. They, you, can, you can see violence and you can see murder and you can see death just going to the movie theater or watching the average movie versus you have to be an adult and, and it's almost taboo to watch people making love. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, and I know a lot of parents, they don't want to talk to their kids about being fully embracing their body and their sexuality and talking about genitalia and this is the clitoris and this, you know, doing like talk, like having that discussion, I think in Western culture is off limits in a lot of families and schools mm -hmm. the, or so, the, the, the lessons that do take place in schools, I think are, is lacking. So I guess maybe one of my questions is what would need to change so women aren't, when they're adults, they aren't kind of behind the eight ball in terms of being able to really talk openly about it or... I think, I think quietly there are changes being made, but they're not, they're not pervasive enough. And I think the younger generation, the generation um, b below us, or at least a maybe a couple below me, is, is, is different. They're, they're more available. There is sex education on TV if you're willing to tune into certain channels. There's um, a recent, I think it's called the ohmygodyes.com, where you can go and watch <laughs> you know, explicit, non-pornographic female educational. It will give you um, specific information about sexuality. That's, um, people say it's not erotic, it's educational. So I think it's changing. And you're saying what should need to be happen? I think we can all relax about sexuality. It's, it's interesting. It's a powerful, powerful motivator. It's a powerful force in our world. Uh, I mean, you think about it, it's quite big. It creates life. So people have a lot of feelings about it. I mean, For it's, sure. you know, it's like religion. I mean, people have strong feelings. So you, you kind of have to work around that. Um, but I think the people that I know want to have a great sex life. Almost everyone I meet wants to have a great sex life. So why are we not moving? Right. Yeah. So. Well, and then even on that note, there's, there's having sex or making love, yeah, yep. which I'm sure that could be a whole other topic, but I'd love to hear if you have thoughts yeah. just surrounding that. Yeah, well, um, I really like to see, and this is why I work with couples more, mated people. We have to get to the hula girl. When you just said that, I wanted to say that um, two of my most enthusiastic, spontaneous endorsements came from men who happened to pick up their wife's books and read them and said every man should read this book. Almost as though they're almost kind of a voyeur into the mind. They, they felt like a voyeur. In fact, one of them, after his wife got home from tending to her mother in another city, almost apologetically said that he read it, took it off the shelf and read it. 
And he said, every man should read this book. And the reason he said that, he said, was then they know it's not personal to them. Right. There's all these other reasons why their woman may not be, have, may have low libido or have a change in her desire, and it's not them. And it was very relaxing for him to see all the other things that go, women are up against. So what I'm hearing is women get a copy of the book and, and just have it sitting around. Yeah. Just having it sit around the house, just just kind of haphazardly, conveniently leave it in uh, in the bathroom or in the bedroom or on the on the coffee table somewhere, so so uh, your partner your partner can pick it up. Yeah, women are complex in that way. I mean, we're complex, but we're also it's worth it. <laughs> it's definitely worth it. So, do you want to jump into the hula? Yes. Okay. okay. Hula girl, you also need the hula girl. And this is a symbol of your relationship to your own female sexuality. You need your hips. Your hips are important, your pelvis is important, and you want to have a, a great feeling about it, and you want to move remembering that you have a pelvis and, and you have hips. And I say that really not to be trivial, but to remind you that you are a female creature who has an aesthetic, who, who brings something into the room that's like the flame, that's, that's activated and alive, and the whole world wants it, and you've got it. And so in order to share that, you first want to have a relationship with it yourself, your own femininity, because then you are free to share it with whom you choose. But if, you, if you're so work-oriented or outcome-oriented or tied to certain identities, you're going to forget who you are really, and then you won't have that to share with your partner. And that is what that's part of the magic of the chemistry of, I think, what makes relationship great. So don't for, bring your hula girl in and don't forget you have hoops. Oh, sorry, not hoops, hips. <laughs> hips. <laughs> yeah. where, does, where does the idea of art or kind of, kind of the stereotype like, oh, women as a sexual object. Yeah. How do we have that be okay without it being undermining? Meaning how is it okay to be to be elegant or pretty or sexual or maybe even a fantasy, how can that be without it also being derogatory? I think research has shown that we're programmed, our attention is triggered by certain shapes. And they've done this with men looking at you know, curves or certain waist hip dimensions. And it's across culture that male attention is triggered by certain shapes or contours or things. That's not debatable. You know, that grabs your attention. But something that grabs your attention doesn't mean it's love. It just means your, you, right. your attention is pushed onto something. And it's, it's a trigger, but it's not love. And so you, you almost, if you're triggered to look at somebody, you almost want to know, oh, I'm triggered to look at them, but th I don't really know anything about them. I'm going to watch them over time. I'm right. going to see who right. they really are. This is just a trigger. Oh yeah, I. Uh, she has a really great um, bosom, or she, you know, those. <laughs> I'm those hips really got my attention, you know. But it doesn't mean it's love, and it doesn't necessarily mean it should. You should take an action based on that. Or that it doesn't mean that it's undermining. No, the relationship. it exists. It right. exists. Right. You know, um, it's part of you know you you we are these programmed biological creatures and we have certain things that are built in we didn't choose to be that way we're just that way you know that women get aroused by story and context and things i don't know that women would choose that but it works right and you want to make it work for you in the context of a available a relationship that you choose just, just on that on that note i want to say something just for the women that like you said that Let's say like you're walking in the grocery store and you're with a partner and let's say in this, in this case, let's say that the male partner, uh, uh, an attractive female walks by and the male looks and looks back. And I know there's kind of the, right. the, the stereotypical woman will kind of do one of these like, hey, what are you looking at? And I think there's like you said, there's certain reactions. I use the example like this. So the next thing that I'm going to say, I want you to not think of this. So I'm going to, I'm going to describe something. I want you to not think of this. So do not think of an elephant with white tusks. So I'm willing to bet that you have a picture of it. Uh, you, in your mind, you have a picture of an elephant with white tusks, even though I told you to not think of it. So just the fact that I said that, it's already there. And I guess what I'm getting at is that for, for us as humans, we go through life and there's certain stimulus for things that comes our way that we, that we respond to and that we react to. And then we have the decision of what we do next. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I would offer, and I'd love to see your input, is how does it be okay for 
for a partner, and maybe this comes down to security within the relationship, mm -hmm. um, that it can be okay that either a male or a female or a partner or whatever that, that, that couple is, how is it okay to have an attractive person from, attract, I'll just leave it as an attractive person that walks mm -hmm. by that you respond to, just like I'm, now I'm thinking of an elephant with white tusks just because you said the word, mm -hmm. that you respond to and the partner is secure and okay enough that they don't give them one of these or say, what are you doing? Or kind of hit them over the head with the umbrella kind of thing. Right. Well, I don't know that it's not terrible if they did it in a, you know, a real light-hearted way, but if they really believed that it was anything more than um, a reaction, it, it does depend on the security of the relationship right. and, and whether they've talked about it ahead of time and how what the interpretation of both of them has for that behavior because it's interesting to watch sitting where I'm sitting and knowing that our attention is triggered by certain things. I'm not very judgmental about somebody who watches pornography occasionally because it's... Um, if you're using pornography as an arousal tool for a male who has low arousal, it's a whole different context than if you're doing it um, as a substitute for being present in your relationship. So, you know, it's like pornography itself, um, if, it's, if the context is to use it as a, a treatment or as a stimulus so they then can perform for their partner, personally, I don't have a problem with that. Now. I've had many times where a woman's in my room and she's devastated because she saw her partner look at pornography. And I wish that I could give her my point of view and my knowledge about attention patterns because often the male still really highly values his wife. And they may have, want to have a discussion and not have any pornography in their relationship. That may be what they choose, which is a great choice. and her interpretation of him looking is so different than it possibly could be. He thinks she, he's, in, she's, he's in love with that other woman. He'd rather have that body than my body. He's um, unfaithful. There's a lot to discuss there between them, but it doesn't necessarily mean what she thinks it means from my point of view. Now, there are certainly those who are not a good relationship person and are watching pornography, and that's a whole different uh, category of responses. So I think context has a lot to do with that question and the security of their relationship. I know couples who have um, worked with relationship material a lot, and they know about these attention patterns, and the guy will notice this attention going there and will not react out of deference to his partner being present. I have a girlfriend who was with her husband, and this um, woman went by, the, and we were all there, that he, you know, he, and he just went, he, he just was blasted with this femininity, and he turned around, and she just gave him a slap, and it's been a humorous thing ever since, you know? It's like, he didn't, he was overwhelmed, and he just turned, and she gave him the slap, and it was over, you know? It's just, <laughs> you know, just acknowledge that, right, you know, right. when it's, when in a, in a way, when it's inappropriately on display, you're, you're kind of bombarded. And you, right. you actually can be annoyed as a man that you're bombarded if you're bombarded more than you want to be. Or it can be a pleasure, depending on where you are right. and who the person is. Well, so I guess just even around pornography, do you typically find that, that that's a detriment to, to intimacy and relationships and, and fanning the female flame? Or do you find... That it's helpful, or does it, or does it really depend? It on, really depends. On the, uh, there's on a the small couple. percentage of couples who watch pornography together as a sexual aid, uh, but that's very small. I'd say mostly I would direct people away from pornography for the most part, 99% uh, of the time, because what you want is for them to build up what's going well in their relationship and their their sexual experience. And there are exceptions to that, usually with um, arousal difficulties or other things. But for the most part, I would direct people away from pornography. Now, there is... Um, so as a general rule, it's been your experience that you would, if, if you had to pick one or the other, it sounds like the first thing I'm hearing you say is it depends, case yeah. by case. Yep. But if you had to just put a blanket statement, you think that, that typically it's more erosive to a relationship or intimacy than it is potentially helping? Yeah. 
Yeah, I would and say for that's the, for true. the female or the male or or the couple or and, and well, I don't, I I don't mean to say male or female as that's the only thing we're talking about. Yeah. But just from a, from a partnership, I guess. Let's just leave yeah. it at that. Yeah. Um, it feels like infidelity to the person not watching. For, okay. That there a lot part time it feels like infidelity. So there has to be a lot of context to have it be okay. So a couple has to have a lot of context to be able to watch pornography either together or individually. And for the most part, I say it doesn't work because there's not that context. And then do you think maybe, where, where does the role of, of, of fantasy come into, into the bedroom? Fantasy is, um, is helpful in that, it, again, it helps with arousal and it also helps people to identify what they like. We're not, it's simple, you know, there's other parts of ourselves that you, if, um, that you want to have honored and you can get honored in a sexual relationship. So sometimes you can work with fantasies like if you had a fam fantasy, like the woman had a fantasy, she would like to be rescued by a Texas Ranger. Right. You know, her partner can put on that hat. Right. You right. know, and you can role play. Um, there are other fantasies that are more involved that involve would involve a lot of permission. Um, but you it definitely plays a role. We have we want if we want to have a whole body experience. We want our mind engaged, our our spirit engaged, our energy. Our, we want to be all engaged, and if there's a little part of ourselves that really we have a kind of more of a Kama Sutra like partner, and we'd rather have a Clark Gable. We can ask our partner <laughs> to to be Clark Gable, you know, for sure. the evening, you know. So because you have an imprint of what works for you, right? And you have this hopefully safe and available partner, and you can play off each other to make it interesting. So it seems to me that in in that in that sense. You're in, in a moment going into a different relationship in a different space in your mind. And you're going into a different experience almost to the point of where that partner that you're with physically isn't maybe necessarily where you're at in your mind because of that fantasy. So in that moment, you're almost kind of recreating a different partner experience. Right. So how does that play? And that's, in? A, that's different than role playing. That's really having one thing going on in your head that's different than what's going on in the room. Right. Yes. Okay. Because obviously, like you said, like watching pornography, you know, you're, you know, I, I know for a lot of men, they, they look at it and they, they, they think of themselves in that situation and that, and they think of themselves in that role. And I've heard the, the saying it's, you know, pornography for men is kind of like hitting the evolutionary jackpot. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if you think of it like, you know, the, the male lion wants to mate with as many lionesses as possible. And pornography for a male is, oh my gosh, I have all these, you know, kind of at my disposal, like a click away kind of thing. And, and they can put themselves in that, in that role mentally. So if you're doing fantasy or role play, and I, and I appreciate your distinction, so I'd love to hear more on that. Where and how does that play into? Is, is that almost a form of infidelity? Yeah, well, I think... If you're role-playing or thinking of something else in your mind? You know, it's not, in my view, it's not the optimal experience because you want to be closer to that person. Some of the best sexual experiences are when there's merging right. of a being. Right. And so if you've got something going on in your um, fantasy that's completely unrelated to what's going on in the room, you most likely are not going to have one of those great merging experiences. So I would say it's limiting and at the same time, I do know there are couples who make their sexual work because fantasy is what's arousing. And then, particularly for the male, there will be performance issues. So if that cu couple is happy with what's going on, I would just let them be. I'm not going to sure. upset it. But if they're frustrated by what's going on and they're, they want to get closer, then you could work with them to try to be present completely with each other in the room. I'd love to, so before you answer, I'd love to see if we can get some people watching to respond. Do you think, and so I'm, I'm going to ask you this next, so I'll, I'll give you some lead time, but I'd love to hear it. Just, so put a note in the, if you're watching this right now, put down yes or no. Do you believe that, that humans are meant to have one partner in their life? Meaning, I, I guess, because there's the debate of, should you have one partner your entire life, or should you have multiple partners, or are there chapters? So I'd love to just hear, so if you're watching this right now, just put a yes, meaning yes, if you think that, that people should have one partner their entire life, or no, if you think that people shouldn't have their one partner for life. And I guess this even kind of spills over to marriage and, and just relationships and dating versus, um, uh, you know, monogamy versus, you know, 
polygamy or polyamorous or and so forth. So I'd love to hear. So if, if someone, if anyone's willing enough, no, no one's responding right now. I, I know there's a lot of people watching right now, but no one's willing to respond. So just put down yes or no. Yes, meaning do you think, yes, that you think people should have one part in their entire life or no, you don't think they, they should have one part in their entire life. So go ahead and put in there just yes or no. Cool. So Cindy says yes. Jennifer says, I don't know. Fair enough. I guess I'd love to hear, what are your guys' thoughts on that? Or guys, gals, pe the people watching, do you th what, do you, what are your thoughts around having one partner for life or not having one partner for life? I see Melody says, well, in this age, it is very hard to have one relationship. So I guess maybe the response then from there gets into where does marriage fit in? And, and I know, f I, know I've, I have um, actually a, a colleague of mine and she, um, she, she and her, her husband have a very, a very open relationship. She even she even travels and she goes to conferences and so forth. And I, I've you know I've talked to her about different um, health related issues. And we were at a conference and she just we, we just started talking. And it was in a pretty it was a group setting. She actually said this on on stage. So this is uh, I'm not going to name who it is, but she said it in a very open setting. She said, Yeah, when my husband and I we have a very open relationship, and we don't do anything secretively. When, when I'm away, he'll kind of fulfill the the fantasies or things that he wants. And when I'm away, I do that. Um, you know, I, I have my own personal thoughts on, on that. And, and I, for me, I wouldn't like that for, for me and, and my partner. But for her, it seemed, it seemed to work. You may say long term, that's not going to work. I'd love to hear your thought. But uh, I see that also I see someone else says, now that I'm with one partner um, I'm with, I'd say that I could be with him forever and be totally satisfied and fulfilled. So maybe it's finding the right person. So I guess on that vein, I'd love to hear what are your thoughts on one partner, multiple partners, different stages of our lives? Yeah. How does that so feel? I'll give you a personal response first and then okay. a professional one. Okay. okay? Personal, personal but professional. Personal first. You know, it takes a lifetime to know a person. And I've enjoyed being with this person so much. I, I mean, the facets and the complexity and the wonder doesn't end. So I would say I vote one person. It's worked for me. I, and, no, and I have to say I was married and then remarried. The second marriage okay. is for me. So, um, so the I appreciate marriage, the comments that, you know, you may, you may not be, it may not be one person. And if you don't like, feel like sharing, that's fine. So w do you mind sharing a little bit about what, what was, maybe, maybe wasn't right? I mean, I, I know we're, yeah, we're probably okay. personal. We don't, personal, we don't I just say it, I wanted to be cherished and I wanted to be the center of a person's universe. You know, why not? Sure. So, and I got that and I've had it for 21 years. So it's not, you know, that you have to know what works for you. That's what I wanted. And I didn't get it the first go round. I got it the second. Do you think that was more you or more, or more them? Both. Yeah, I think, you know, basically my husband and I are both lovers by nature. So we just matched up. Sure. Yeah, that, it worked. You know, there's, such this, there's something called serial monogamy. You right. know, <laughs> you know, right. so that's, I, I think you know, that's probably what human, most humans yeah. probably have serial monogamy Yeah. for the most part. Yeah. So, but professionally, I support what a woman wants. You know, I work with her to make her health, you know, safe to, in, and healthy, but what she wants. And I have partners who do are polyamorous and I have partners who are swing, some clients who are swingers, you know, we work to support their health and their choices. The bulk of the people and the people in my book are mated with one person because I have a, a fondness for how they make that work, you know, and to support that. But no, but I have clients and patients that are, do, do everything and I support them in their, their choice. Well, I know, I know for me personally that uh, I do, I, I know that there's things that, that with, with my, my partner now that, that she may do or I may do that I find endearing, that in previous relationships I would have found annoying. Mm -hmm. And so I look at it that, well, what's changed? And the only thing that's changed is me. So I look at the things of, I think if, if I was who I am now, how, how would I have been knowing what I am now and the things that I've grown or evolved into and, and how I view the world and, and I hope to, to think my own self-awareness and growth, how would I have been differently in previous relationships and maybe how would that have turned out? So again, I come back to self-awareness and, and having patience and, and tolerance and love and compassion for that. I, I remember I was in, a, in a, um, a personal counseling session talking about relationships. And the counselor was asking me, what are the things that drive you crazy about your partner? And I, and I couldn't come up with anything. And she said, you're being too nice. And she said, look, yeah, if you were maybe ultimately enlightened, 
we could we could take an enlightened person and prop them in, plop them into any relationship, and they and they and they'd survive and do and they'd thrive. But the reality is, is that that very few of us are to that enlightened state, and that there are going to be things that maybe bother us with the other person. If you're saying for you, like we have this serial monogamy, mm -hmm. and at first it didn't work, but now it did. Where does personal responsibility and accountability start and stop in that process of finding the, the right person versus finding the right you? Yeah, that's, that's such a loaded, that's so, it's such a juicy question. <laughs> <laughs> really, really, Schnarch, who wrote books, he wrote a book called Passionate Marriage, and he really called marriage a, a people-growing machine. And, and it's not just marriage, but relationship grows humans, and they get better. Um, so you get better, you learn about yourself, you learn what doesn't work. We all have these areas where we don't perform well, you know, where we, it's not our area, and then we have other areas where we have strengths. And so we may have been caught, you know, in an area where we didn't know, you know, do well, or else our partner may not have been feeding us back the messages we needed to thrive. You know, you really want to uh, point to your, I think you want to point to your partner's highest things they do the best all the time and you right. want them to point to yours and you grow each other and when you point to the highest things those grow stronger so I, I think maybe you weren't in that situation where you're pointing to each other's highest and best right. and and also when you when you connect sexually in the bedroom you're so much more forgiving about other things you don't really care who, who did, took out the garbage the last time you really don't you're relating to a different part of them. And, and that's part of why I do this work is that the transformation that happens in your daily life when you connect sexually is really significant. Right. You know, so we have a co colleague at work who just went through a, and I won't say who it is, who just went through a uh, challenge, a marriage challenge, and she and her husband had sex every day for 30 days. And th this woman does a lot, you know, for her to find the time to have sex. You know, this was really, <laughs> and she just said it brought them so close. You know, and they were so much better humored, and they weren't fighting, they weren't critical of each other. And yes, it, sometimes they were really tired, but the end result is she liked the state of having sex every day for 30 days, and the, the closeness and what they did there for their relationship much more than she liked the before. That's a, that's a good challenge. I've heard the, uh, I've, <laughs> I've heard the, you know, let's do a, a, a 30 day you know, juice challenge. Let's do a 30 day exercise challenge. I love the 30, 30 so there you go, a 30 day sex challenge or, or, or love challenge. What would it be? Was it a 30 day sex challenge or a 30 day love challenge or would it not matter? It was, they had to have sex every day for 30 days. Okay. It was a relationship thing, building peace. So what you said goes back to, to me, the, the idea of Investing in the process, not the outcome. Mm -hmm. And I use example, if you invest in the outcome of, if your goal is to be married, well, what, just for rough numbers, 50% of marriages end in divorce. And so if you invest in that, you have a 50-50 chance. And the only way you know if you win is when one of the partners passes away. Because you only have, you, there's only one way to say that you won at marriage, and that's to go the whole distance. So to me, that, that to me, marriage from that standpoint seems like it's set up to fail in that the only way to win is to go to get to the finish line, but you have all these things to lose along the way. Versus the way I like to look at it is investing in the process of waking up every day and saying, how can I be the best partner that I can be every day? And what can I do to be the best that I can be every day? And knowing that investing in the process will give you the best chance of having the desired outcome, which is to me, a long lasting, fulfilling relationship and relationships. I mean, obviously relationship with to me, I look at it as that one person in life and relationships with family and friends and, and your mm -hmm. close circle, yeah. the things that really matter. I'd love to hear your thoughts. What do you think about in terms of, because people may try all these things and think, oh, this isn't, this isn't working for me. And, you know, Susan, I read your book. I'm doing all these things and my sex life isn't any better. It's not working. So I guess I haven't gotten one of those. <laughs> oh, well, awesome. Well, so well, so yeah. your sex rate, yeah. your, yeah. your sex rate, yeah. your success rate on sex is 100%. Yeah. I love it. So, so, so what would you say in terms of maybe investing in the process versus the outcome and, and not beating yourself up if it's not working right away? Yeah, I like what you said. And I like what you said about focusing on the moment and what you're going to do in the moment. Because, you know, you're waking up every day. That is the moment. There's your partner. You're going to be curious about that partner and how you can be closer together. 
you didn't say that. I'm adding that. Yeah, that that's fine. Uh, yeah. If it makes so you sound smarter, is, let's do it. <laughs> this is the, that's the focus. Um, mar I think marriage makes a difference. It makes a statement to the community. At this point in our culture, being married and watching people go through weddings, um, no matter if it's a woman and woman, man, man, man and woman, it makes a statement to publicly carve that space. Yes, out. it makes a change that people appreciate. And I think it does, things do go deeper as a result. So it depends on your end goal. I, I wouldn't think that the end goal is to die married. I would think the end goal would be to get as close as you possibly can and have the, yeah. yeah. So I agree with you. I'm just, yeah. I'm saying the, the till death do us part. Yeah. The, you know, through sickness and health, till death do, us, death do us part, there's this, like you said, there's this carved out space. And I think there's, you know, and, and I think times are changing. I think the younger generations, I think, like you said, the serial monogamy, I think, I think may be more open now. Do you think there's a place for marriage in the next generation that's coming up? I mean, I know, I think of my grandparents, I think they were married from 19 until they died. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of the older generation, that was, that's, that's set. Versus the younger generation, less are getting, I think even getting married and are looking at having kids. So I guess, where, where do you see marriage having that place as society moves forward? Yeah, I think it's changing. And I think um, there's less um, uh, shame involved with divorce than there was 30 years ago. There's more um, support around that process. I don't know. I wish there was more education about how to make relationships great and work earlier so that people didn't have to go through that kind of process. Um, I think I love the um, rainbow community, you know, pointing to you know, everyone's important and all differences aside is really a nice frame for relationship too. I mean, the fact that you wake up every day and you value what's really great about the person is a different model than the stereotypical roles of the 50s or the in the 60s where he goes off to work, she stays home. Right. There's a lot more choice, a lot more honoring of personal uh, expressions and, uh, and men can stay home now with less, you know, eyebrows raised, and women go off right. to work with with more support, and so uh, I think it's changing, and uh, there's a lot more capacity to write your individual ticket, which I think will make for greater success. So, so I'm going to make a statement. You may not, may or not, may or may not agree with the statement, and then I'm going to follow up with a question. So it may be completely misguided. So I, I I feel that in society there's this sense of making the female more masculine. Yeah. And I think there's this, this is in society of equality, and please not, I'm not trying to put women down at all. Rather, I feel like there's this, there's this movement of, of, of equality, and, and I, I, I feel that that's potentially going to cause problems. Now, I don't, mean, I don't mean that people shouldn't be treated fairly, but when I say, but, or, or equally, but I have, but to me, I think there's a little asterisk that I would word, add to the word equality, and I'm being very careful as I'm wording this, because what I mean by that is, that, that equality to me means that one and the same. But when it comes to, I'm not saying male or female, but masculine and feminine, they're, they're very different. And there's a yin and a yang. I, I believe that there's a very benefit to having a masculine and a feminine energy and what they provide with that. And I think it's okay for a female to be masculine. I think it's okay for a male to be feminine. But to try to get everyone to the same level, which I, I feel in society there's this push to try to get females to almost be more masculine and rise them up to to certain certain areas in society, that maybe there may, might be unintended consequences of that in terms of almost creating like an asexual society mindset. I I, I agree with yeah, you. I don't know if, if I if, you, you did, did a good you, job. You, you yeah, you did a good question. You did a great there? job. I notice it in the generation younger than me that my my son and daughter-in-law and friends that they they dress with less gender in mind. They 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 downplay gender instead of upscale it. I'm not for upscaling it. So you're more for accenting. I upscaling. think it adds sparkle to life, and I don't like the boring downplaying gender. And so, but there's something in what they're doing that I really respect. The women are more confident and assertive and uh, progressive, and I think it's going to roll around. I think when women have their chance at the workplace to get equal pay and to be CEOs that we're going to see a relaxation of that um, drive. And I think it's going to naturally come back to where a woman can be at the boardroom 
and use her feminine power, it won't be, it won't be dismissed. I mean, there's all sorts of studies um, that show that in a boardroom, a woman will suggest a very creative idea, and then it's repeated 10 minutes later by a male, and it's seen as his idea. Oh, he's brilliant. <laughs> yes, exactly. And so they, they think women are cooperative, more cooperative in decision-making and um, volunteering. So when, that, when we work through that, which I don't know how long it'll take, maybe her expression of her, whatever she suggests will be seen right away as hers, and, and she's contributing it to the whole group, and it won't be attached to the male you know, idea. We might see a cultural change is what sure. I would say. So I'm willing to go with this, this, even though I cringe at the gender, the downscaling of gender and femininity and, and why? Because it adds less sparkle to my life. When I, I look, you have a chance to have fun and you're walking down the street. Now you can walk down the street in gray shirt and gray pants and no boots as a woman you know, no boots, no earrings, and you think it's a lost opportunity. <laughs> you're only alive. You're alive now. Live. You know, don't. You, you've got this body. You've got this um, being. Have fun with it. Show the universe who you are. Express. You know, and and you're downplaying and pointing to I'm a strong person. I have no needs. I'll get the job done. You can choose differently. There are other things to add on that add. Um, aesthetic and sparkle and so going back to the masculine and feminine where do you see the masculine and feminine in the, in the bedroom yeah well feminine is receptive they, there's a big receptivity to feminineness but it's not passivity you know being receptive is a very active stance and you need to get behind it it's a wonderful capacity but it's not being passive. And there's been a thought that being receptive is being passive. That's a, that's a great distinction. I break it. You, so, can, you can be receptive and be actively receptive. It's a wonderful capacity or power. But it doesn't mean you're passive or not a player or something's being done to you. So I think you really want to dispel that. And then women like to experience male power. And they experience it in the bedroom. And, they, and, and other places. But it's an experience. It is, it's a chance for you to be with somebody who's physically more powerful and enjoy it. And so I think there's a big role for um, the gender in the bedroom. And, and you can play with gender, too. You can be creative. You can, um, you can be the opposite gender if you wanted to. You, you can do whatever you want, but there, it's powerful to work with gender. You know, if there's role play or fantasy, other things going yeah. on, um, you know, that, that certainly is a whole other conversation. But for this point, what I'm hearing is being actively receptive. And I think that goes back to what we were talking earlier is, you know, in terms of fanning the female flame, is it comes down to the communication and the connectivity and being vocal in, in terms of what you're wanting and needing and stepping into that and being okay with that. Right. So, so to me, it sounds like the power comes in order to be actively receptive and taking charge. It doesn't mean you have to bulldoze him or bulldoze right. the situation, but you need to be a bulldozer in creating your own space and being accountable for how you're communicating your desires, your wants, your needs, mm -hmm. being active, not being um, docile or, 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 or passive. Waiting. Okay. Women wait. Right. And it's like, don't wait. Or, or, or it's, think now that, is the moment. Or, Say what you want. It's in the moment. Or, do it not in a teacher voice. Do it in a lover voice. You know, it's now. I think that probably goes against what the, the, the cultural aspect of women and sexuality. I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think there's this underlying tone that women shouldn't really be talking about their sexuality. Um, so they've been in this point of whether spoken or unspoken, they kind of go through life thinking that, it's not okay to really say this. And I'm going to say very stereotypical here now that they're there just to please their man. Yeah. Um, wh whether, and I don't, I don't obviously agree with that, but I'm saying that I think there may be, and, and I think this has changed a lot, but I think there may be some old yeah. kind of mindset and culture that, that's, that's kind of trickled and kind of seeped over to where we're at now. I think it's, being, it's changed, but those generations that are still there, I think it, it's got to be okay to... It, it's, it's got to be okay to have that conversation. Yeah. And, and, and I think for me, like you said earlier, it's personalizing it. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't come across as, gosh, you're such a bad partner. It comes across as what I really would love would be, what do you think about? Was there a question in that? I don't think I was getting to a question, but it was a thought. But, yeah, it's but, okay. But, but I guess I was kind of recapping what I was hearing yes. about, about being actively receptive 
And, and what I think what I'm hearing is, I guess correct me if I'm wrong, what I'm hearing is that be, be, active, be active in the communication, the discussion of what you want, what you like, what you're needing, and just personalizing it and, and investing in that process, not just expecting that your partner is going to do everything right. Yeah, and I'll tell you a story about that, that gender piece. There was a woman that I worked with, and it was a success story in the, in the book, actually. She was a CEO, and she was on the board, and she was very male in her actions. She was linear. She made um, sharp decisions. She was action-oriented. She was decisive. And she had a hard time in the bedroom remembering she was feminine. It was a big deal for her sure. to let go of that control. And she did. She, um, and it was after her husband had an affair and everything fell apart that they re-looked at all of what they were doing. And she um, started wearing Victoria's Secret lingerie. She wore pink. She just said it was really tough for her to let go of her decisive personality, the, even in the bedroom. The masculinity. The masculine part. And to, be, to know that it was okay, you know, and to enjoy the, wearing the more feminine things. And she really liked it. But it wasn't an easy thing. And sure. she ended up really liking it, but it was difficult. That men and women aren't equal in the sense that, or let me back up, that masculine and feminine aren't equal. They're very different. And to me, we should celebrate those differences. I am so with you there. I, I really am with you. It's where the real juice comes in relationship. And it's also where the real, um, when you talk about having extraordinary sexual experiences, it's when those two merge that that happens. It's not from. It's not just orgasm that causes the emerging. It's the whole being, um, being so close that you have kind of emerging experience. Or some of the reports that I get that are the most profound. So, and that happens when you're really available. You're not. In, you're you're really available, and your gender is really available, and you're not repress. It takes a lot of energy to repress things. So why waste a lot of energy? You know. <laughs> You know, I, you, you don't want to hold it back. It's a, I think of how much time we spend in our brains thinking about a decision that we yeah. don't do. And if we would just do it and get over it, there's such a, a, a experience and a world waiting on the other side of that indecision. Yeah. Like you said, we spend so much energy on indecisiveness or just thinking about, thinking about something. Yeah. I think there's a Tony Robbins quote I love, and he says, Exchange, replace your expectations for appreciation and you'll have a huge transformation in your life. Hmm. And I think about that for my life. Whenever I, whenever I see something in my life that I'm expecting to be different, meaning, and the way I read that is whenever I'm frustrated with something in my life, is, is you know, gosh, like an, an expectation. Gosh, I'm so, I'm, I'm expecting that traffic will be smoother so I'm not stuck in traffic versus training for an, expect, uh, an uh, appreciation as I'm so appreciative that I even have a vehicle that I can get to work in. Mm -hmm. or that I, that I have that I can drive to the coast or go do something fun with. So I like the idea of, well, just from a partner perspective, and this is one of the things that I've even been working on with me or for myself in relationship is trying to change expectation for appreciation. And just that shift is, has been huge in terms of what I found is it's actually turned areas of negativity in my life or frustration into areas of admiration and endearment. So how would you see that maybe playing the role into... Again, maybe that stereotype of women, again, the stereotype of, don't they just understand what I'm thinking? Well, it's interesting. You're talking about reframe. <laughs> you know, you're reframing right. things. It's so important because in any moment you can choose where your attention goes. So if you want your attention to go on your partner's weakest characteristic, you can choose that, or you right. want it to go on the best characteristic. So that reframe, I think, is useful every moment. You know, what are you going to pay attention to in this moment? The thing that's wrong or the thing that's right? The thing that's the weakest, the thing that's the strongest. So right. I, I'm with you on that. I think that's a life skill that's wonderful to have. Yep. To me, it starts here. I mean, so much of it is starting there and how you approach things and, if, and trying to be aware and looking at your internal self-chatter and, and just all the things that we do here mm -hmm. that then affect, affect our world. Yeah. Uh, oh, so here's a good question. Why do you think that men don't open doors for women anymore? Yeah, because they've gotten flack, you know, honestly. I, I think that they've gotten enough flack that they are inhibited from doing it. And I say that when um, I offered some classes to the men who were partners of the women who were in the other classes. And we did a few of these classes, and there may be 12 or 14 men per class. And what I did was tell them about women and what women want. 
So, but in that class, I had a very powerful moment. It changed me. It actually changed me a lot. So the question really came up about, I think some man shared an experience of opening a door for a woman and getting a negative back. And we talked about it, and the men were curious how they could offer a compliment. They noticed beauty in women, and how could they offer a compliment to a woman who wasn't their partner safely, right, without, getting, without them feeling like it was a come on. They just want to have a response to the beautiful blue eyes or whatever it was. And what changed me was when I went to give my answer, every single man was so attentive. It was such the such powerful attention in that room to Edge what I was going to say that I realized every single one of them had wanted the answer to this question. And it was just, I, I've, I've never been the same when I realized, I know men like to help, and I know they um, notice women's beauty and and. Um, and I know women could benefit from men articulating it to them because it's a positive message and helps women show themselves more and relax. So I knew it was a good thing to get behind, you know, that this would happen. You right. know? But we want to do it in a, in a way that would work, work. But what impressed me was how uh, quiet and still the room got and how on the edge of the seat the guys were. And I just went, shoot, they, they really do, really do want to... Uh, have a role here. And, and I would agree with that. I would say that for me, I know that I want to protect and I want to, I want to be that protector and that provider. And to me, that, 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 that feels very inherent mm -hmm. in, in, in who I am in terms of wanting to be that protector, not necessarily a nurturer, mm -hmm. um, but more of a protector. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's not so much, oh, tell me, you know, how you're feeling. It's more, hey, let's get your butt in gear and let's solve it. You know, it's, it's the how do we fix things right. versus the cry on the shoulder thing. And, I, and I've, I'm learning how to do both, yeah. uh, which is a skill. I think there's two pieces with that. And, and I'd love to hear your input is that we have this, it's on the, there's this Me Too movement. Mm -hmm. And there's this, there's this Me Too movement, which we legitimately need to look at and we need to, it needs to be addressed. And at the same time, looking at are we potentially now going over to the other edge where now the pendulum swings the other way to where now good intentioned men or, or people in general now are withdrawing because now, now they're thinking, well, per perfect case. I went in to pick up food. I went into a restaurant and I ordered a to-go order for my girlfriend and I. I went into the restaurant and went up to the front and, um, and I, I went up to the front and this gal at the, at the front, she had on this really beautiful dress and a really attractive pattern. I really did like the pattern. I said, and as she was checking me out and everything, and I would say, oh, great. Oh, is everything in there? Okay, wonderful. Yeah, or what was your, or no, she's verifying my order. I said, yeah, great. I said, um, yeah, I really like your dress. And then as I said it, I immediately had almost a recoil of, oh my gosh, is she going to think I'm coming on to her? Or is she going to think I'm now misogynistic? And now, like my brain immediately went to like, oh my gosh, did I just do something wrong? Okay. When before I wouldn't have thought anything of it. And now I actually go to the point of, of hesitating to compliment a, a woman on how she's dressed or her hair or a physical attribute for fear of, even though it's my intent to try to find something that genuinely I am appreciative of, as opposed to, hey, baby, do you want to come back with me tonight? Uh, is saying, hey, you know, I really like your dress. Or, hey, those are neat earrings. Where did you get that? Or, hey, boy, I really like the pattern of your dress. So I guess we're, so I'd like to hear that because to me that goes back to the, and, you know, holding the door. Yeah. Where, where, do, where does, and I see Norm put on their chivalry is not dead explanation point. I like that. So I'd love to hear your response to that. Like, yeah, how my, do, how my do response navigate was, this or how do women help them navigate it? My response was don't stop. Don't stop offering it. Even if you have to tone it back a little, or land, land a little more gently than you would have, don't stop because it is food for them, and it will, it will, you will, you will be benefited in the long run. Even though you may get an angry woman, and you may get somebody who misinterprets what's going on, I wouldn't stop. I would just hesitating before you say it is not a bad thing um, because you're calibrating. <laughs> right. But I would still offer it. I would probably, this day and age, I'd probably hesitate, and then I'd offer. I mean, <laughs> but by hesitate, I mean calibrate. Right. You know, assess the situation and then offer it because women want it. They want to be appreciated and they they are probably also on their guard. So if you can just say say it in the, like you said, the most well-intentioned way you can possibly say it and right. let it land, you're probably going to be okay. Right. 
nine, you know, 38 out of 40 times, maybe, right. you know? And, yeah. Well, I was going to say, yes, I think there's a big difference between saying, wow, I really like your dress versus saying, wow, I really yeah. like your dress. Exactly. Lands completely different. But even then, even with that, wow, I really like your dress. That, that's really neat. Where'd you get it? You, you could always say, it's just like my wife's that I like or something yes. like that. Yes. You know, that says I made it and... You know, and yeah, I'm still to, offering to, you to, to try to yeah, yes. have a little pressure relief value. Yeah, yeah. And I think I even did say that. I said, yeah. I said, wow, I know my girlfriend would really. I, I think I've actually in, in instances yeah. where maybe I felt that the person yeah. didn't take it the way I intended. I would follow it up with, oh well, yeah, my girlfriend would. You know, she always you know wants to know right. where girl where where is the best place to shop or something like that. Right. Um, which I think is maybe a good way to navigate. And I think that's where we kind of get into this balancing act of how do men still be that protector, that role, or giving those compliments without women feeling vulnerable? Because there is that, because there is a, a power dynamic. And you know, it dynamic. goes back to that signaling we talked about at the beginning, when you're giving the right signals and when you're giving the wrong signals, and how loaded your signals are, like you just demonstrated. Right. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's nuanced. You know, it's nuanced. So, but yet there's a real genuine emotion on the male to offer it, and there's a real desire on the women to receive it. So I say plow ahead and just do it with intelligence. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a good thing. So what would you t say to women then in terms of their response and how, the, and how they could potentially foster that? And I think it says most, most women like it when the man is more powerful in the bedroom. So we can maybe get back to that one. I thought maybe that was an add to that. So I guess, what, what advice would you give women in terms of, like, just the, the idea of chivalry? What advice would you give to women to help foster that without sending mixed signals? You could talk to them about their capacity to receive a positive message, you know? Do they, have a, do they receive them and do they hear them? Because a lot of people, even in unloaded situations, will deflect compliments. You know, but right, are they, right. you know, are they there? If somebody really says, I like the color of your, you know, scarf, or you look gorgeous in that, do they let it land, you know? And if they don't let it land, you can just, if you're working with them, is just um, help them do that. Help them hear it and, let, and receive it. Right. And sometimes the person delivering it um, doesn't deliver it quite to them. They might just be an intellectual idea, it doesn't really land, and sometimes it really lands. So um, there's an art to giving those messages. You want to you wanna give it so it lands, and you want to be a person that it lands in, right, you know, right. so, so, so it's So I think subtle. it comes back down to, again, that, to me it sounds like the ownership of, of where, seeing where it lands and then giving communication or feedback back. Mm -hmm. in terms of where and how it landed yeah. or what could be done differently, so either from strangers or from your partner. I think the woman would say, thank you, I appreciate that. You know, that would be, if it landed and she got it, she would say, uh, oh, it's a cheap thing I picked up. And she wouldn't say that. She would say, right. thank you. Right, right. You know, I got it. Wonderful. Well, let's see if there's any other questions in here. So, oh, so most women like it when the man is more powerful in the bedroom. So maybe that goes back to the masculine Feminine, what are your thoughts in terms of power dynamics in, in the bedroom and in, yeah. in, in, in the moment? They vary. You know, some people really are Kama Sutra equal, not doing a lot of powerful things, you know, doing a lot of positions, maybe a lot of breathing, maybe, you know, so, and other people really do want a powerful, there's a high percentage of women who really want a dominant male some of the time in the bedroom, somebody who will pick them up and put them on the bed and uh, ravish them and, and they appreciate it and they can tell their mate that's what they like. And some women like that 10% of the time and like other right. things other times. So right. if you, yes, it's true that women can like a dominant male and feel the power and feel the confidence in a male. You know, women get off on that. So yes, there's a role for that in the bedroom. Wonderful. I guess, yeah, I'd love to hear your, your, your summary, or if there's anything else you'd like to add. Otherwise, I'd love to hear your summary. Yeah. Well, I think I would say um, I'm really an advocate of women and men and all combinations between, really, truly, because I think um, the men in my office get high marks. You know, the women come in and they don't speak ill, mostly, of their men. They speak highly of them. So I would say have confidence. You're doing well. I get good. I hear a lot of nice things. Keep doing what you're doing. If anything, pay more attention to her. And um, for women, I would say find your hips. 
That would be the way they say, find your relationship to your own sexual spark. It's a, it's a journey sometimes if you've been talked out of it by your culture or your religion or your family. Um, it's a journey back, but it will uh, feed you in ways that are supportive and powerful. So, you know, do that. I love it. I, I heard, and I'll try to share maybe some of the things I heard, and you can add to it. Is I, I love what you said about being actively receptive, mm -hmm. which you know, playing that playing that role. I heard communication and that being direct in terms of what you're wanting, what works for you, even right. all, everything from throughout the day or even during during intimacy. I, I, I think, and then and then obviously I love that the bulldozer, you know, making space, making time, and then finding your hips, and then um, you know, w working towards owning it. Yeah, great. That's a great way to say it. I love it. If uh, if you want to get a copy of the book, you can go to Amazon. It's in the it should be in the links there. Fanning the female flame: How to increase your sexual desire without changing partners. With my good friend and colleague Susan Pressler, uh, been in healthcare for how long? Have you been in healthcare now? Thirty-eighth year. Thirty-eighth year. Thirty-eighth year. So she has some. <laughs> so so here. So she has her distilled down. Uh, her distilled down. Uh, suggestions. So get the book, check it out. If you have more questions, feel free to message us there. Uh, thank you. Oh, so wonderful. I'm glad that you're getting some information. Enjoy the book. And if you get the book, we'd love to, if you can go on Amazon, leave a review. Uh, so if you go on Amazon, please leave a review on Amazon if you get the book, or if you just like this segment, leave a review on Amazon. Uh, you can find more information on our website. Uh, we also have the classes, or you can get uh, go to our, get our newsletter or, or message us as well. Um, Susan, this has been great. It's been, been a, yes, a, a ton really, of fun. It's really been wonderful. Nice. And I guess we didn't even get into talking about handshaking, but that would be a whole other uh -huh. thing for another time. I'm Dr. Gallen. This is Susan Pressler. I hope you found this interesting. If you found it helpful, great. Share it. Like it. Help us get the, the message out because our goal is to help as many people as possible work towards their health goals, ideally without the use of drugs or surgery, as the primary approach to health care. So we pride ourselves on a first, second, last philosophy. First is natural solutions, just like we talked about tonight, um, and working with natural solutions, mindset, lifestyle, second being medications, and then third, uh, trying to avoid as much as possible is surgery, of course. So if you found this helpful, like it, leave a comment down below, share it with other people, help us get the word out so we can help as many people as possible, helping them make the rest of their years the best of their years. So again, I'm Dr. Gallant, this is Susan Pressler. Have a wonderful night.